Uh, hello, uh, this is uh, Paul Cockshot. He is the author of many books on Marx and economics. One of them is the word semi socialism, also how the world works. He's a computer scientist. Um, he dabbles in application of computers to the Marx and economy. And today he will be presenting us a PowerPoint presentation about democratic planning and democratic uh, allocation of surplus in a planned economy. So, if you could go ahead. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, share my screen now. Can you see that? Good. Okay. What I'm going to give is a combination of material that I originally presented in Hanoi at a, a meeting on the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution and material that I've prepared on democratic voting systems. Now, in our book Towards a New Common, New Socialism, I say Towards a New Communism, which is what it really is, um, the there are two themes, direct democracy and labor time planned economy. And the idea we have is that there are two types of decisions that have to be made in a socialist economy in deciding what's going to be produced. Some of these relate to things which are going to be free or public goods, like how much labor to devote to education, how much to devote to the health service, how much to put into environmental protection, defense, and new investments. And our basic suggestion is this can be done by direct voting using computers or mobile phones by the whole population. On the other hand, the non-public goods, the things which are going to be consumed by individuals have to be operated on what on Marx's equivalence principle that you get back in goods the same amount of labor after you've paid taxes that you perform and hence goods should be priced in labor hours and there should be cybernetic feedback from sales to the plan to adjust output to, to consumer units so Let's see how direct democracy could work in a technological era. Now, the internet and internet technology has brought us lots of things. It's brought us e-commerce. It's brought democratic access to information, democratic expression of opinion via blogging. There's new collaborative ways of working have been developed in the open source community. And there's some degree of undermining of monopoly via P2P networks. And there's a whole bunch of theorists, the Keimform theorists, argue that these are the germ of a whole new social order. But so far, it's had little impact on the political system. So let's look, can we use a modern communications te technology to democratize complex social decisions, like, for instance, the state budget? So what you need are socio-technical protocols, things which combine social rules with technology. And what protocols would be necessary for participatory budgeting? So I'm going to present a basic e-voting protocol suitable for yes or no plebiscites, and I'll then extend it to show that it can be applied to multi-dimensional decision-making by the population as a whole. Now, if you're going to have a voting system, it has to meet a certain set of social constraints. The system must be understandable to the public. And paper voting has that property. People can make sense of paper ballots. People need to accept the system. And again, paper systems are widely used and generally acceptable. And they have to be, the system has to be simple. People need to be convinced of the security of the system. People need to trust it. And it must be easily accessible. There mustn't be an income barrier to using it. 
Now, some replacements of paper voting by electronic voting don't meet that. They don't meet it in various ways. Most obviously, in the United States, where they use electronic voting a lot, or electronic vote counting a lot, the process is obscure because it's proprietary software and the software can't be verified. In order to have trust, you must have anonymity and you must have auditability. It must be possible to prove that the votes counted were the votes as cast. It must be easy to use. So casting a vote must be very simple. We are saying mobile phone voting is the probably should be the basis for it because it lowers the bar to participation. More people have mobile phones than have computers. There's no geographical or time constraints imposed. And you, people must be familiar with the device. In, in the UK, at least, mobile phones have over 100% saturation in the sense that there are more mobile phones out there than people. Um, though you still got to take into account not everyone actually has one and we'll see that so what we're proposing is a voting system that either uses mobile phones the the public telephone system or dedicated voting landlines at public polling places this the assumption is that everybody would have a voter's card and in order to get a voter's card, you put your hand into a jar and withdraw a card, an envelope containing a card. So no one sees which envelope you get. The state can't control who gets which envelope. And nobody knows which card you've got. The card looks like a credit card, has got a number on it, similar to a credit card number. Now, in the UK, there's about 30 million voters, so you need an eight-digit pin, eight-digit voter number. We extend that to, to an extra four digits, which are the purple there, which are the, your personal identification number. This is your voter's number, and there's your pin. I'll explain the difference between the two later. Awesome. So there are many ways you could vote. You either, if there's a vote on a yes or no question, telephone numbers would be published uh, as numbers to which you send text messages. One number for yes, one for no. So the, there was a, a Scottish independence vote a few years ago in Scotland. We tried to persuade the government to use this. They weren't ready to use it at that point, but the idea was there should be a a number you dial if you want to leave, and a number you dial if you don't want to leave, Scotland to leave. The, as it turned out, there was a lot of controversy over whether the paper voting system was counted fairly. So you then send in the body of a text message, your voter identification number, or if it's in a landline, you dial it up and you key in the number and there would be free, free landlines provided. In order to track the votes as they arrive at the voting centers, which are receiving these messages, there's a real-time clock showing the, the votes cast. Uh, why do we have that? It's to prevent vote stuffing at the last minute by some um, unauthorized agency. Uh, any anomalies would be publicly visible on this TV channel. At the end of the vote, a complete list of the yes and no votes with the pins removed is published on the internet and in the newspapers. That means anyone can check whether their vote was recorded as a yes or a no correctly. But 
because no one else knows what your voters number is, they can't determine who voted which way. So you can independently check that the totals are right. Anyone with a computer can add up the computerized list. Anyone with a, a newspaper and a ruler can add up the, col the yes and no columns and see which is longer. And the published voter numbers can't be used again by a third party since the pin is elided when it's published. Nobody knows, you know your vote was recorded correctly. No one else knows your voter's number, so the vote is secret. Now, politics involves more than just yes, no issues. You have things which involve ranges of numbers. How much should you spend on health expenditure? And you have interdependencies between decisions. Spending more requires re raising more revenue. Uh, cutting taxes implies cutting expenditure. So how can a, a basically discrete process be extended to handle this? Now, this is one of the deficiencies of electoral democracy in that the voters don't really have any control over the final spending and tax decisions of the state. Now, a simple way of doing it is since you, you want changes to be gradual, you can say, let's say, are you in favor of raising income tax by 5% or reducing it by 5%? Or if you're happy with the current system, you don't have to vote. Now, suppose you had the following statistics. 40% of people abstained. 5% said cut by 5% and 20% said raised by 5%. Well, you can add all those up and you get an average. And the weighted sum there would be cut it by 1%. So given the fact that you can express things as ratios and people can say yes or no to that, these percentage changes, you can compute what the consensus is. On, on what people want. Now, I've just given income tax. Potentially, you could have multiple votes on these. You could have vote, votes on value-added tax, the base rate of income tax, the higher rate of income tax. <clears throat> At the same time, there are multiple headings of expenditure that could go up, health, education, transport, defense, et cetera. And if you add these up, you end up with essentially a vector of votes or of changes you want. No change to income tax, half percent cut to VAT, 5% uh, increase in the high rate of income tax, 3% increase in health service, 1% on increase in education, cuts in transport and defense. Now, that kind of vector decision exists even now for where the finance minister and a government. He's choosing a point in the vector space, even though if he's not a mathematician, he doesn't think of it in those terms. The problem with places where they have direct voting on taxes, as like California, is that it tends to just result in people voting the taxes down and having no say on expenditure. So it's a one-sided policy, and that policy tends to be followed by conservative administrations who want to, to, to drive down public expenditure. So they give people a choice on tax, but not on expenditure. Now, if you just said, let people vote on tax and expenditure, you get another problem, that people will vote for less taxes and more expenditure, in which case you would get a huge budget deficit. So you have to have some constraint built into the system um, in terms of the incremental budget deficit you're willing to accept. So if people can vote on how much of a budget deficit they want as well, then you can resolve it to a, a feasible vote. Now, the simplest one is just assume a budget 
balanced budget constraint, but you don't have to have that. If you've got an n-dimensional vote vector, this implies an n-dimensional decision space. If you put in uh, a budget deficit constraint, that along with the current shares of tax and expenditure defines an, a hyperplane of one dimension less than the n things that you're, you, you're allowed to choose on. And this is a feasible set the feasible set in mathematical terms. And there are well-established algorithms to find the closest point on an n minus one dimensional hyperplane to, to an n dimensional point. Um, but we'll illustrate that just with a simple picture. Suppose that you have two choices, just two dimensional space, expenditure change and tax change. And voters want 4% increase in expenditure and only a 2% increase in tax. Uh, this, the 45 degree line is the balanced budget line, and that represents the feasible choices. So this is what voters have, have voted for, this blue point. The closest feasible point is that position on the ba balanced budget line. And if you look at it, that turns out to be a 3% increase in both tax and expenditure. If the thing is expre expressed as an abstract mathematical problem, it's baffling to people. But you can re-express this quite simply. 4% increase in spending, 2% increase in tax, you split the difference, means a 3% increase in both. So although the general case is complex, it can be explained simply the basic principles of it. Now that is the democracy aspect. Now let's look at the, the issue of time. There's an old tradition of this, 19th century socialist tradition of it, uh, or 19th century communist and socialist tradition. When speaking of communism, Marx wrote, labor time would in that case play a double part. It's apportionment in accordance with a definite social plan, maintains the proper proportion between the different kinds of work to be done and the various wants. On the other hand, it also serves as a measure of the portion of the common labor borne by each individual and of his share in the total product destined for individual consumption. The social relations of individual producers with regard both to their labor and their products are in this case perfectly simple and intelligible, and that with regard not only to production, but also to distribution. And this was in capital. He expresses similar ideas in a better known passage in the Critique of the Gotha program. And he's proposing here a first simple model of communism that where people are credited with hours worked and goods are marked at the public warehouse with their time content. Yet in an earlier writing, Poverty of Philosophy had argued against the proposal by the socialist Proudhon to have a simple labor pricing scheme. Now, was Marx being contradictory here? Was he criticizing his opponents for something he himself advocated? I don't think so. There are two distinctions between what Marx was saying and what Proudhon was saying. Marx was not saying that the labor credits would circulate as money. He wasn't saying there would be banknotes printed with one hour on them. And unlike Proudhon, he's assuming social production, um, public ownership of industry, rather than private petty traders. This still leaves another objection that he makes in the poverty of philosophy, that the socially necessary amount of labor that should be allocated to production depends on demand. It, doesn't, it can't just be fixed independent of demand. You need some kind of oscillation of prices around values. 
uh, monks set in poverty of philosophy. Suppose it takes one hour to make a shirt and it'll be marked in the public stores at one hour. But if this 1970s style of shirt is no longer wanted, you'll find the stocks won't sell and the state's shops may have to sell them at 30 minutes or even 10 minutes instead of 60 minutes. So under those circumstances, the planners can see that some goods are selling below their labor part content, in which case the planners are, decide to make less of them. On the other hand, if goods are selling above their labor content, that tells the planners to make more of them. But these deviations are temporary and cancel out over time and across different goods. So overall, if you average it over all the different goods that a person consumes, they will be getting one hour per hour expended. The important point is that the, they don't circulate. That stops them being money. Marx said um, they would be just used just like theatre tickets. They're issued to you and cancelled out after use. You can't repeatedly use a theatre ticket to go to the theatre. So what Marx was saying is different from the earlier ideas of Robert Owen, who was issued these labor notes, which were going to circulate. And if you do that, you, you will still get a, a, a black market on which they would circulate. So you wouldn't suppress commodity exchange doing that. Now, that's why Marx says a certificate, not a note. He says a certificate recorded how many hours you as a particular individual have worked. So it's not, a, not money. The circulation, of, to prevent circulation, that certificate has to be tied to the person. How would that have been achieved? If we, we can look at how it might have been achieved in the 19th century, um, the, shortly after Marx, the American socialist, Bellamy, proposed a system what he called social credit cards based on the recently invented punch cards. Your hours worked would be printed on it and they would be canceled out when you went to the social store with a punch like, the, like this one here. So you'd punch holes in them to cancel them out, much as a train ticket is canceled out by punching a hole in it. That prevents it circulating. And he envisaged buildings like classical palaces, where people would shop using their cards. His story was set in 2000 AD. Uh, he wrote it in the 1880s. And you'd go to the, the social sh shop, choose an item from a catalogue, or, or by looking at it, you say, I want this. Your card would be cancelled out, and then the goods would be delivered by pneumatic tubes to your house. And because in those days, no one had cars, he didn't think, imagine that people would be able to drive to a shop and come back. So pneumatic tubes would deliver things. So the, the paradox here is that the idea of a credit card was actually invented by a socialist. And his horn of plenty palaces are much like a modern shopping mall. And his tube delivery system foreshadows Amazon. If you're doing it now, the, the cards are gonna be electronic. You'd use the standard kind of smart card and a labor ministry would keep time accounts of how long everyone had worked and software would prevent private transfers between accounts. So there's no circulation, no black markets. There are five actors at play here. Now let's look at um, the hospitals, schools, etc. I mean, all private, all public services. These are the employees. There are some publicly owned industries. There are shops, and there's a Ministry of Labour keeping the records. <clears throat> 
Now, the important point here is if you do your economic accounting in terms of person hours, it translates directly into the division of the workforce between activities. So you start off with assuming 2 million people are working in the public sector and 4 million people are working producing goods. Since all labor is directly communal, everyone is a public employee and therefore everyone gets credited by the labor ministry for the number of hours they've worked. It issues just as many labor credits as the hours done last week. Now, since there are 2 million people working in the public sector, somehow 2 million working weeks of time have to be cancelled out. And essentially this is done by just deducting 2 million to a tax bin and cancelling them out. They don't, the, the government doesn't have to do anything with those, it just zeroes them. Four million are then spent by people in the shops. And this now balances the number of people working in the shops. And again, these are cancelled out. So the two sources of cancellation exactly balance the number of people. So once spent, credits are just binned, just like a used train ticket. No point in keeping them. In return for four million person year or person weeks work done in public factories, people get goods that take 4 million person weeks to make. And for simplicity, I'm ensuring work for net investment and flows of manufactured goods to the schools and hospitals. That's just to simplify the diagram. Um, and both of those would imply a higher rate of income tax to, to ensure a balance between personal expenditure and the labor available to meet it. Lessons from this are, you don't circulate the labor credits. Everyone's a public worker, not an employee of a firm, which is what's different from, um, for instance, the Soviet system, where people were actually employed by the individual enterprise. And there are no enterprises in that sense. These there are no enterprises receiving ruble goods, rubles for goods they produced. It's more like the way the education system works in most countries. There is, there's no transfer of funds into the education system for children attending the schools. The point is here, workers get the full value of the labor they perform. So public services and net investment are then funded out of income tax. And all comparative costings are performed using the true social cost of things, the number of person hours that have to be expended. And there's no money and there's no profit making by socialist enterprises. They're, they're, they're not accounting units. Now, all this has been based on the assumption that you can plan the economy to balance the expenditure of labor against the allocation of tokens. So how can this be done? This is going back to proposals from the 1920s when the Austrian socialist economist Neurath advocated that what a socialist economy had to do was learn from war economy and use calculations in kind, not money. He said planning should be in physical terms. He said that during the war, it had become evident that to survive, states had to plan and prioritize physical production of key raw materials, labor, foodstuffs, etc. And he proposed this as a method for socialist planning. I imagine that in the period he was talking about, Slovenia was under Neurath's economic administration because he was 
supervising the planning of the Austrian war economy. Now, these ideas from Neurath produced a response from other people in Vienna. The von Mises said, oh, no, 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 no. Only money provides a rational basis for comparing costs. He said that calculation in terms of labor time would be impractical because you'd have to solve millions of equations to, to do it. And then you get a later generation or later wave of Austrian attacks on it by Hayek, who, who says the market's like a, a telephone system. It exchanges information to tie up the economy. And it's the only way that you can solve the problem of dispersed information. Well, is this true? Let's look at the scale of the problem the issue. In the mid 50s, Gauss plan could prepare detailed material balances for about some 3000 products and had some control over about 30,000 others. And I'm getting this from an article, a contemporary article by Morris Dobb. By the late 60s, there were several million distinct products in the whole Soviet economy, which is something that Nov claims. I don't know whether it's true, but it's plausible. And this was more than could be handled in detail by the existing Gauss plan staff, which amounted to about three or 4,000 people trying to do the planning administration. Let, let's see what it implies in terms of calculation. Suppose you have a million products and each one requires 200 components to make it. So you can describe any production process as a list of pairs with the product code of your input, the amount that you require to produce one unit of output. If you're looking at that in computer terms, it's two full words of computer memory. And for a million products, you'd need say 400 million words of computer memory, say 1.5 gigabytes. That doesn't seem much now by modern computer standards. Ideally, you want it in, in fast RAM, but at a pinch, you could do it on, on disks. By the mid 1970s, you could buy disks like these shown here. And in the mid 1970s, projects I was involved in did actually have disks of this model. And those are about, the, the best ones were 300 megabytes. We could only afford 80 megabytes, our ones. In addition, you would have needed about a million words of RAM. I'm assuming that you, 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 you implement the algorithm on disk since you can't afford the RAM. Um, the best US technology didn't reach this level until the mid seventies. So US computer technology of the mid 1970s would have been up to the task. But it wasn't really possible in the 1960s. So if you look at the, the difference between what Marx had been talking about, he was going to say, in a communist economy, you shouldn't have money. You should have calculation in terms of labor time and use values and payment in terms of labor credits. But to work out these labor contents, you need to solve millions of equations. And you just couldn't do it with 1960s technology. So instead, the Soviet system although they did use some computers, still used money for economic calculation, even in the planned sector. And it had a problem of aggregation in using these monetary objectives in that provided people met a certain monetary value of output, they weren't too concerned when they had the sub subcategories of goods correct. So the, you couldn't handle a disaggregated plan at all union level. And money was still being used for wage payments. And this led to black markets. It led to corruption. And it led to constant pressure to rationalize and replace plan production by market production, which led to perestroika and the very rapid destruction of the, the plan system. 
Now, how easy would it be to solve the um, millions of equations? There are some problems which, when you scale them up, become computationally infeasible. And is economic planning in terms of labor values like that? No, it's not. Um, I'm not going to go into it now, but in a series of papers, I and my co-workers have shown the computational complexity of this sort of problem grows as order n log n, which means it's highly tractable and easily solved using modern computers. It's possible it's actually even lower order than n log n. What has happened since the 1960s? Well, we've had, got the internet, we've got giant databases, we've got supercomputers, we've got electronic payment cards. The internet allows the real-time cybernetic planning and solves the problem of dispersed information. Big data allows a concentration of the information needed for planning. Supercomputers can solve the millions of equations in seconds, and the electronic payment cards allow replacement of cash with non-transferable credits. So the model we advocate is that production takes place, goods are sold in terms of credit, labor credits, market clearing prices are formed for the goods, the plan agency or computers from the plan agency compute the ratios of labor content to the market clearing prices, and adjust the final output targets. From the final output targets, you can compute the gross output targets because not all output goes to final consumption. You compare that with requirements and resources. If, if these don't allow those outputs to be met, the algorithm iterates until it comes up with a solution. Once it has come up with a solution, detailed production plans are formed and orders are sent to the factories. The, there's a historical paradox in that Soviet socialism and economic model rested on what Engels way back in 1847 had identified as potential common ground between communists and social democrats. But he warned against the illusion of the social democrats that socialism was itself enough to produce a lasting solution. Democratic socialists, he said, favor the same measures as communists, not as part of a transition to communism, but as measures which they believe will be sufficient. And this is something which people forget you get a lot of people saying nowadays, oh, Marx was a socialist, and socialism and communism are basically the same thing. They're not. As way back in the 1840s, Marx and Engels point out that whilst communists agreed with democratic socialists on many things, we don't think that the measures involved in socialism, which were brought into play, for instance, in the Soviet Union, and to a lesser extent were even brought into play by the British Socialist Government of 1945, that the, we don't think these measures are sufficient. So long as you retain a monetary economy, you will end up with conflicts. So, the, the Soviet Union was socialist, but there are internal contradictions in all things, and there are contradictions within the socialist system itself. And these could only be resolved by moving over to a communist system, not a socialist system. But the last leader that the Soviet Union had that really was interested in communism was Khrushchev. And there were a number of internal flaws to his strategy for how to get there. Uh, in particular, they didn't follow the proposals that um, Soviet economists were making at the time or a wing of Soviet economists were making at the time to move to a cybernetic system. And the crisis has got to be resolved by overcoming 
the limitations of manual bureaucratic coordination by getting rid of money and moving to direct labor time accounting. And hopefully society will overcome these contradictions next time. I think that's the end. <laughs>